Hi, I'm Ken LaRue from Autodesk, and I'm your host for the next four and a half hours in a training series I'm calling Autodesk Flame Compositing 101. These videos are aimed at a new user of Flame, someone who's never touched it before, but you might have used other compositing applications. We're going to start off at the very basic level of understanding the software, creating projects, users, the UI, importing footage, all this stuff is going to be covered. And then we're going to slowly get deeper and deeper into the compositing environment, which is called batch inside of Flame. Now, what's really exciting is we're going to use a real world example that was created by a very well known flame artist named Joel Osis. Joel did some work for a company called Trendil, and the client was Molson Coors. And Joel did work on several of these shots, and like I said, he's been kind enough to let us use one as the basis for our training. I want to definitely thank Molson Coors. I want to definitely thank Trendil for letting us use the footage, and obviously Joel Osis for allowing us to use his work. Now, I've been told that I talk a little fast, and maybe I do, but if you think about it, the four and a half hours of training you're getting, it's probably really about eight. So here's my recommendation to you. While I'm going through these videos, watch each one of them without following along, and then watch it again and follow along. They're broken down about 10 minutes. Some are like 16, some are five and six minutes. There's 28 in total, and like I said, it's over four hours of training. But in the end, I truly believe you are going to have a strong, solid understanding of Autodesk Flame and how to composite inside of it. All right, that's enough of me talking. Let's get going and start learning Flame. All right, so the first thing we need to do is launch Flame. So I'm going to click on the icon in my dock to launch Flame on my Mac. If you're using a Linux system, you can use the icon on your desktop or launch Flame from a shell. When Flame launches, the first thing you're going to see is the Flame startup screen. Here is where you're going to determine what project you want to launch into or open and create new projects, what user profile you want to use. You also will create new user profiles, edit and delete user profiles and projects. There are also other elements such as the host computer and your workspace. These are both relevant for when you are working in a collaborative environment where you're working with other artists on different system and sharing workspaces between each other. That's not going to be covered inside this video series. This is really aimed at a brand new user to Flame, so you're going to be one artist working on one project on your own. But we do want to cover the project creation and the user creation because obviously that's pretty important. Right now, on purpose, I have no user and I have no projects created on the system. I wanted the Flame startup screen to look exactly like what you are probably seeing when you first launched Flame. But as you'll see in a second, once we create projects or users, you will access the different projects from this area where it reads click new button to create a project. And that's what we want to do. We want to create our first project. So I'm just going to click new and a new project dialog box will open up. The first thing we do is we name the project. I'll name this project Flame 2017 Compositing 101. Frame rate, and then if I click the return key or click in the next field, the name for the project will then be created. The field below that is the nickname. Now the nickname's purpose is, let's say you're gonna render your end result out of Flame and you wanna use the project's name as a token to be part of that rendered file's name. I don't want to add the name of the full project, Flame underscore 2017 underscore compositing underscore 101. That's a lot, and I don't want that as part of my name. So I can give this project a nickname, and then when we go to render later, you'll see you can add tokens, as I said, including the nickname of the project. I'm going to give this project a nickname of F2017 underscore 101. The next option below that is the volume. And when you first install Flame, it's going to ask you, where do you want to put your volume? Where do you want to put the media storage? So that every time we process or render something internally within the application, it's going to generate files and put them somewhere. It's your intermediates. This is where that's going to go. Flame will make a suggestion to you during the installation process. Generally, it's going to be the largest attached drive you have available on your system. I only have one volume for this system, and that volume, that folder, is located on my Promise Pegasus 2. But if you had multiple, you would click on the area where it reads Autodesk Media Storage, and you could switch and use other volumes. 
But as I said, I only have one. It's telling me how much space or frames I have free. It's telling me how many frames I've used. As I said, I've got no projects on this system as of right now, so that's why I read zero. And then again below, you can see that there is the destination, the path for my, my volume. That is created automatically for you when you installed Flame. And then below that, we have our setup directory. Now, when you create a project, Flame is going to create a whole set of subdirectories, subfolders that it is going to use to save setups and store information about your project as you're working on it. An example would be I'm working in a color correction tool and I want to save the setup for that color correction tool. Flame will automatically save it to a specific destination. And I'll show you where this is located later. You really shouldn't even worry about it though because let Flame handle all of this in the background. This is a, one of the beauties about Flame is that it takes care of all this and you don't have to worry about it. And then at the end when your project is done and you want to archive it, Flame is going to take all this data, all this information and it's going to archive it for you. Again. We're going to talk about that later. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves. Now, you could choose a setup directory from another project if you wanted to. But in our case, we're going to leave it be the default location where Flame is going to create this. And we're also going to leave our setup mode at new setup. If you had other projects in here, you could choose to copy a setup mode from another project. But in our case, once again, Everything is brand new here. We're going to leave this at new setup. And it's pretty obvious, but I should just mention it, that the new directory, the folder structure that's going to be created is going to be named to match your projects. Below that, we have our resolution. The default resolution for Flames project is an HD 1080 project, so it's 1920 by 1080. But of course, we click on this and you'll see all the different preset project resolutions you can choose from. You can choose custom to create your own resolution if you need to. So as you can see, Flame can work in any resolution that you want, even if it's custom. I will leave it at 1920 by 1080. Below that, you have the fields if you wanted to customize this. Then we have our aspect ratio box and our ratio slider. Again, you get the different options that are most common, 4x3, 16 by 3, 9 I'll leave it at 16.9. For the bit depth, I'm going to switch this to be 10 bit. Then next to that, we've got where we're going to be working in fields or progressive. I'll leave that at progressive. And then below that, we have our graphic bit depth. And I'm going to highly recommend that you almost always leave this at 16 bit floating point graphics. This is for whenever we're creating graphics inside of Flame. We want to keep everything looking as good as it possibly can, nice and crisp. So that's why I like to have it set to 16 bit. And then over here, we've got our config template. This has to do with your broadcast monitor, which I do not personally have on this system. But if you did, you can you can set up exactly what the config template would be for that broadcast monitor. By default, just so you know, it's going to match the resolution that you choose. Below that, our frame rate. This is pretty straightforward stuff. Choose whatever frame rate you want to be working at. I'm going to leave it at 23.976, which is the default for the resolution that I've chosen. And just for reference, when you change your resolution, you'll notice the and the config template will change based on the resolution that you are trying to use. I'm going to set this back to our 1920 by 1080, and my bit depth goes back to 10 bit over here. And so once again, I'll leave my config the same, and my frame rate is going to be at 23.976, as I said. Now, the color policy, this is the way that Flame displays different formats, different color science inside the viewports. By default, the preset that it's going to use is the legacy preset, and this is what has been in Flame for years. But if you wanted to, you could switch to color policy, which would automatically change what a viewport, how it displays certain files in that viewport, whether it's red files, eerie files, and so on. We're going to leave this at legacy and not touch this because we could spend hours discussing the color science with inside of Flame, but that's a little beyond what this video is trying to achieve. And then down below, we have a couple different tabs, proxy and the cache and renders. So let's first talk about the cache and renders. The first option is your preferred format. So this is the intermediates that are being created, the rendered files that are being created and placed in this volume as you are rendering and processing things with inside Flame. If I click 
where it reads Apple ProRes 422HQ, you'll see there are several different flavors of ProRes you can choose. There's the legacy configuration and there's the uncompressed configuration. Also, there is an option to transcode media during the import process. This again will control exactly what file format those transcoded files are going to be. I'll go back to this flyout just to explain something. You'll notice that all the flavors of our ProRes and our Uncompress have a version of itself, but then there's also one that says raw next to it. What is the difference between that? So let me quickly explain that. I'm going to leave this set to the default, the ProRes 422HQ, and I want you to look over here where it says format restrictions. The bottom one reads alternative formats, and the options are DPX, EXR, and RAW. If I switch this to the RAW version of any one of these, but I'm going to switch it to the RAW version for our 422HQ, and you will notice the EXR option for alternative formats disappears. The EXR format is not a format that is available with this preferred format. So as a rule of thumb, if you're going to be generating EXR files, use the non-RAW version of a preferred format. If you know you're not going to be generating EXR files in the end result, then you could use the RAW version. But I'm just going to leave this set to the default Apple ProRes 422HQ for our project. Now I'll go to the proxy settings tab and here's where you have your options for setting up your proxies while working inside a flame. You got your proxy media. What resolution do you want your proxies to be? A half, quarter, an eighth? You also have the quality box that you can choose different algorithms for creating the proxies. You have options to generate proxies by default and you also have the condition setting so that depending upon the width of the file, proxies will then be generated by default. I will leave again everything set to the default as it is. I'll go back to the cache and render tab and I click the create button. Flame now creates the project 2017 Compositing 101. Now just for demonstration, let's create one more project. So I'm just going to click new. I'll name this one new project. I'm not going to put a nickname in this one. I'll leave everything set to the same and I just click create. I'm doing this just to explain to you that now if I click on this fly out, I see all the projects, the only two that I have, but I now see them there. And this is how you will switch between your projects when you're starting flame up. If you ever want to delete or edit a project, you would choose it from the flyout, and then you'll see the button that reads edit. Clicking on that is going to bring up the edit dialog box for your project. And in here, you will be able to modify this project. You'll notice in the right corner, it reads cancel and modify. And over on the left side, the flyout reads modify project. If I click on that, I now have the option to delete the setups for this project or delete this project as a whole. Keep in mind that deleting a project is permanent. This is something you cannot undo. At the end of the videos, we're going to learn how to archive projects and restore projects. So before you ever delete a project, make sure you do not need anything from that project because it will be gone. I will click cancel because I do not want to delete this project. And I'm just going to switch this back over to the Flame 2017 Compositing 101 project. Also, just a couple other quick notes on the projects. You'll notice that it reads current version here. If I switch that to all version and I click on the flyout, you would see other projects that were created in earlier versions of Flame, and it would list the actual version where you see it reads current right now. It would list what version that was created in. And also, if you open a project from an earlier version, Flame is going to want to update that project to the current version that you're working in. I will switch this back to our current version. In the next video, we're going to start looking at how we create users.